This is Dr. Michael Doherty with Performance Spine and Sports Medicine. I'm the chiropractic physician uh, here at uh, PSSM. Uh, this presentation is geared towards uh, other healthcare providers, whether you're a medical physician, uh, surgeon, or physical therapist, to just kind of understand the role that the chiropractor plays uh, in, in patient care. Um, the title of this is Chiropractic Practice and Patient Management. So what is chiropractic? Uh, of course, we, we you know, hear a ton of questions, or, uh, hear different things. Um, is chiropractic just manipulation or adjusting? Um, in my opinion, no, it's not. It's primarily it's a conservative non-surgical management of neck pain, back pain, uh, and headache. Uh, we also do evaluation and treatments of other musculoskeletal injuries, uh, not necessarily with uh, manipulation. And uh, of course, is it all about lifetime treatments? Absolutely not. Uh, we tend to stick with a, a normal care plan uh, that you would find in any other uh, physical therapy uh, department. So what can you expect? Well, patient intake obviously is uh, very similar, if not the same, as, as everybody else. Uh, we're going to look at the history, present illness, of course, review their uh, past medical history as, as well as go over the review of systems. Um, we'll get their uh, contributory family history, social history, um, and of course their vitals. Uh, from there, we do a neurologic screen, including cranial nerves, depending on the patient's uh, chief complaint. <clears throat> so treatment uh, is based on evidence. Um, we used what's called the Diagnosis-Based Clinical Decision Rule, or the DCDBR. Uh, this was formatted by Dr. Donald Murphy of the Rhode Island Spine Center, uh, along with a few others back in 2007. Uh, basically, we start off by asking three simple questions. Are there any red flags? Now, based on the current literature, um, red flags will present to a chiropractor's office uh, about 2.7%. Um, from there, we rule out the red flags. We're looking at what are the pain generators. There's uh, certain pain generators we look for uh, specifically when it comes to spinal pain we'll go over those and then we look at uh, yellow flags um, what other things contribute to this patient as a whole that would uh, lead to uh, the presentation of pain so red flags of course uh, any symptoms of uh, spinal pathology that are caused by more sinister conditions uh, cancer tumor or some other space occupying lesion um, we're looking for loss or bowel or bladder control uh, saddle paresthesia or urinary retention. Um, of course, we want to check our long track signs. We're looking for upper or lower motor neuron lesions. Um, history of uh, AAA or presentation suggests above a AAA. Of course, gross motor loss. We generally use the criteria, uh, you know, three over five in terms of strength and uh, progressive neurological deficits uh, that are either outside our scope of practice or not responding to the, uh, to the treatment. Um, <clears throat> so pain generators in the spine, generally we, we put everything into, into four categories um, to try to uh, kind of uh, centralize the patient's care. So we're looking at the nerve root, and this would be typical with your, your uh, you know, acute radiculopathy patients. Um, of course the disc, uh, which can be multifactorial in terms of uh, an acute presentation or chronic presentation. We look at the, uh, the facet joints as well as the SI joints, and of course the, the muscles, uh, usually uh, uh, last and, and sometimes the least. So the contributing factors, we talked about the yellow flags earlier. I'm um, looking for a cranial cervical or lumbopelvic instability, which is essentially just poor motor control or, or quote unquote core control. Um, we also look for things like fear avoidance, passive coping, depression, and usually we find this out based on uh, some outcome assessments that we usually give the patient uh, prior to seeing them. Um, of course, central pain hypersensitivity, again, a topic that uh, some know a little about. Um, and I think the research is kind of, uh, kind of up in the air still. Um, but generally we see this a lot with uh, you know, post-MBAs or, or major traumas. <clears throat> So in terms of the, the nerve root or your radiculopathy, um, obviously we want to look for our neural tension signs, uh, straight leg raise, well leg raise, uh, slump test. All of these are, are very sensitive but not very specific, so you may have to uh, further delineate uh, with other testing such as uh, EMG or NCV studies. Um, generally, we're going to find pain below the knee, and again, this isn't uh, you know, clear cut. And these would be the non-responders to directional preference, which would be a McKenzie assessment, which we'll also talk about. 
So disc derangement I find is one of the most common presentations, especially for acute back pain. Uh, we know that acute back pain, uh, the disc is involved in a, approximately 8% of people with acute symptoms. Um, so the way we uh, generally evaluate disc patients is with a McKenzie protocol for directional response. Uh, if you're not familiar, familiar with uh, Robin McKenzie, he was a uh, New Zealand uh, physiotherapist who uh, came up with a, uh, a way to diagnose and manage uh, essentially acute uh, disc derangement patients. Um, <clears throat> what we typically find with a disc derangement is that it's, uh, again, axial in nature. Occasionally you can have radiation, not usually below the knee, but of course everyone's seen uh, stuff that doesn't quite fit the cookie cutter model. Um, there's generally going to be an absence of, of neural tension signs, um, no burning, uh, uh, you know, leg pain in the dermal terminal distribution or anything uh, regarding that. And generally we'll see pain when rising from sitting or pain with prolonged uh, sitting and posture. So the facets and SI joints get a little hairy occasionally. I think sometimes they're uh, overdiagnosed and sometimes they're underdiagnosed. Um, so with the facets, uh, we're obviously going to base uh, it on patient history. So pain with extension and provocative testing to the facets, uh, like your Kemp's exam or even just a facet loading uh, a test. Um, for the SI joint, and we'll get into this on the next two slides, we use uh, Lazlitz criteria, and that's uh, generally three out of five uh, positive exam findings. On, on the five tests that they deemed were the, the best uh, tests for the SI. That includes uh, Gainsland's sacral thrust test, iliac compression, thigh thrust test, and a distraction. Um, now with the lumbar Z joints, uh, that's associated with uh, absence of pain when rising from sitting. So we talked about the disc was going from a sitting to a standing position. Uh, generally the, uh, the Z joints will be from uh, uh, the absence of pain with rising uh, from sitting. Um, whenever we talk about the SIs, and I'm overlapping here a little bit, we want to rule out the derangement first. So the primary thing we want to make sure is not going on um, is the disc derangement. A lot of times disc derangement will mask as, as SI symptoms because of the, the nature of radiation with, uh, with the disc. Um, <clears throat> so we'll talk about this again that the sacroiliac joint uh, it's related to three or more positive findings. Um, pain when rising from sitting uh, and usually unilateral pain uh, without any lumbar pain. So it typically will be under the lumbar spine and there, there shouldn't be any lumbar pain although again we could have multiple, multiple areas uh, affected. So with the SI joint, uh, the SI joint clinical prediction rule is, is a test that it was, uh, or excuse me, a, a battery of tests that, that uh, Dr. Laslett came up with. Um, he finds if there's three or more positive uh, provocation tests uh, with, with the absence of centralization, so they ruled out the disc, um, the, the, uh, the diagnostic performance is improved. Um, their statistics say that the false positive rate is decreased uh, in specificity from 78% to 87%. Uh, so basically low back patients that satisfy this criteria, they have a probability exceeding 70% and if we apply this to pregnant, pregnancy related uh, low back pain, um, it's probably closer to about 90%. So the last uh, pain generator in the spine we look for is, is myofascial pain, trigger points in the muscles. Um, occasionally we do see them as, as primary pain generators, um, but I, I find they're rarely the, the primary source and, and generally it's uh, secondary to something else uh, going on uh, in the spine. Um, and you can review uh, Dr. Chavel's work, uh, which she basically mapped out all typical referred pain patterns. Um, and then you would apply, of course, myofascial therapy, stretching, uh, things of that nature to the, uh, if it was solely myofascial pain. So uh, treatment strategies. Uh, chiropractic physicians were trained in diagnostic imaging and assessments. We're able to order uh, uh, advanced imaging in labs uh, if, if need be. Um, of course, the idea is to refer to the uh, preferred specialist when necessary. And we're often combined in a physical therapy setting with uh, other medical physicians. Um, at Performance Spine and Sports Medicine, we have physiatrists, physical therapy, and, and chiropractors all under one roof. So we're able to kind of uh, inter-refer uh, uh, inter and uh, get each other's opinion on, on, on certain difficult cases. So again, uh, treatment strategies. Of course, we're going to see the patient three times a week for the rest of their lives, right? That's what you guys hear uh, typically with, with chiropractors, but again, that's not the case. Um, we'll utilize what's generally recognized as normal in the, in the PT realm. So we're looking at two to, th two to three times a week for about four weeks. Um, if we're not seeing outcomes in six to eight treatments, we're, we're generally going to change our treatment or make a, a referral to, uh, to, to get something else um, in the picture if we're not quite getting where we need to be. Um, and the patient's usually discharged, obviously based on pain. 
vaccines. Sometimes they, they disappear, but also um, based on outcome measures. Uh, so we use the Bournemouth, we use the Isles Westry, we use the Neck Disability Index along with many other things to kind of determine where the patient started versus uh, where the patient is now. So with advanced imaging, I'm sure most uh, everybody who tunes into this presentation knows this, but um, we're only going to order the MRI in presence of uh, serious or progressive neurological deficits uh, when something underlying is suspected, or when considering surgery or an epi epidural. Um, so again, we have that buffer of probably three to four weeks. Um, we know that, again, based on the literature, that the, the sinister pathology is probably less than 3% of presentation um, to our office. So we'll make the, the, the call to order the MRI uh, if, we, if we deem it necessary. And again, should we have a patient that's not responding to care the way we'd like them to, and we, are, we do think they could benefit from an epidural or possibly even surgery, then uh, most of the time we'll go ahead and order the, uh, the MRI uh, and then send them to the surgeon or physiatrist uh, for their evaluation. So guidelines also endorsed by the American College of Occupational and Environmental Medicine. They recommend the MRI only in the presence of focal neurologic symptoms that persist for at least six weeks and are not kind of trending uh, towards uh, upward improvement. So again, just uh, another thing to keep in mind uh, when ordering MRI, especially if a, a patient uh, uh, presents without having undergone any conservative treatment. So uh, with the diagnosis-based clinical decision rule, to come up with very simple algorithms. Um, I won't bother to go through the, through the algorithm, but essentially uh, we're gonna look to rule out the red flags first, uh, identify the pain generator, uh, number one being the, the disc uh, and, and nerve root, and then after that look towards the facets, uh, the SI joint, and possibly muscles as well. So in terms of chiropractic integration, um, we know the total annual cost of low back pain approaches $100 billion in, in the United States. The healthcare system is under a tremendous amount of uh, not only change, but, but stress as well. Um, so the non-surgical management of the spine saves, you know, uh, orthos, neuros, surgeons, it, seems, it saves them time. Um, if it's not a surgical case, why bother going to a surgeon? Um, go to someone who is a non-surgical specialist that can uh, potentially uh, help or uh, get you to the surgeon when you need to, need to get there. Um, our, our evaluations are based on current available evidence and of course again our referrals are, are made when necessary. We're located at Performance Spine and Sports Medicine, 4056 Quaker Ridge Road, Suite 111. It's in Lawrenceville. Um, again, for the uh, other physicians who tune into this or, or the physical therapist or any other uh, health professional, um, please feel free, fr feel free to email me with any questions you may have. Um, or if you'd like to know about some of the other things that we do here, uh, my email's uh, located right at the bottom here. And that's it. Thank you very much.